Hi, my name is Susan Sample. I'm the writer in residence at Huntsman Cancer Institute, and I'd like you to invite you to take a moment to reflect. In today's podcast, um, I'm going to share some of the writing of Laylee Long Soldier. On a podcast several weeks ago, I read work by Joy Harjo, Poet Laureate of the United States. She was the first Native American woman named and then this summer renamed to the position. One of the young Native women that Harjo has mentored is Laylee Long Soldier. Her first book of poetry, Whereas, was published in 2017, nominated for the National Book Award, and was listed on every best of the year reading list. Long Soldier, who lives in Santa Fe, describes herself as a citizen of the United States and an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux tribe, meaning I am a citizen of the Oglala Lakota nation. And in this dual citizenship, I must work, I must eat, I must art, I must mother, I must friend, I must listen, I must observe, constantly I must live. Long Soldier was a visiting writer at Salt Lake Community College several years ago. Her poetry, as you can tell, is innovative. Sometimes she writes in lyrical segments, sometimes in prose. Her poetry often looks different on the page. Some of her poems appear as squares or columns, and they're often interspersed with blank spaces. I'd like to share one of her pieces today called 38. She explains how the title is based on a historical event unknown to many Americans who don't identify as Native. It's an important story about injustice. I invite you to listen to the way she tells the story and the way she crafts each sentence and how each sentence adds to the meaning of her story. 38. You may like to know I do not consider this a creative piece. I do not regard this as a poem of great imagination or a work of fiction. Also, historical events will not be dramatized for an interesting read. That said, I will begin. You may or may not have heard about the Dakota 38. If this is the first time you heard of it, you might wonder, what is the Dakota 38? The Dakota 38 refers to 38 Dakota men who were executed by hanging under orders from President Abraham Lincoln. To date, this is the largest legal mass execution in U.S. history. The hanging took place on December 26, 1862, the day after Christmas. This was the same week that President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Pro Proclamation. In the preceding sentence, I italicize same week for emphasis. There was a movie titled Lincoln about the presidency of Abraham Lincoln. The signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was included in the film the hanging of the Dakota 38 was not. In any case, you might be asking, why were 38 Dakota men hung? As a side note, the past tense of hung is hung, but when referring to the capital punishment of hanging, the correct tense is hanged. So it's possible that you're asking, why were 38 Dakota men hanged? They were hanged for the Sioux Uprising. I want to tell you about the Sioux Uprising, but I don't know where to begin. I may jump around and details will not unfold in chronological order. Keep in mind, I am not an historian. So I will recount facts as best as I can, given limited resources and understanding. Before Minnesota was a state, the Minnesota region, generally speaking, was the traditional homeland for the Dakota, Anishinaabeg, and the Ho-Chunk people. During the 1800s, when the U.S. expanded territory, they purchased land from the Dakota people, as well as other tribes. But another way to understand that sort of purchase is, Dakota leaders ceded land to the U.S. government in exchange for money or goods but most importantly, the safety of their people. Some say Dakota leaders did not understand the terms they were entering or they never would have agreed. Even others call the entire negotiation trickery. 
but to make whatever it was official and binding, the U.S. government drew up an initial treaty. This treaty was later replaced by another, more convenient treaty, and then another. I had difficulty unraveling the terms of these treaties given the legal speak and congressional language. As treaties were abrogated, broken, the new treaties were drafted one after another. The new treaties often referenced old defunct treaties, and it is a muddy switchback trail to follow. Although I often feel lost on the trail, I know I am not alone. However, as best as I can put the facts together, in 1851, the Dakota Territory was contained to a 12 mile by 150 mile long strip along the Minnesota River. But just seven years later in 1858, the northern portion was ceded, taken, and the southern portion was conveniently allotted, which reduced Dakota land to a stark 10 mile tract. These amended and broken treaties are often referred to as the Minnesota treaties. The word Minnesota comes from mani, which means water, and soda, which means turbid. Synonyms for turbid include muddy, unclear, cloudy, confused, and smoky. Everything in the, is in the language we use. For example, a treaty is essentially a contract between two Soviet so, so, sovereign nations. U.S. treaties with the Dakota Nation were legal contracts that promised money. It could be said this money was payment for the land the Dakota ceded for living within assigned boundaries, a reservation, and for relinquishing rights to their vast hunting territory, which in turn made Dakota people dependent on other means to survive money. The previous sentence is circular, akin to so many aspects of history. As you may have guessed by now, the money promised in the turbid treaties did not make it into the hands of the Dakota people. In addition, local government traders would not offer credit to Indians to purchase food or goods. Without money, store credit, or rights to hunt beyond their 10-mile tract of land, Dakota people began to starve. The Dakota people were starving. The Dakota people starved. In the preceding sentence, the word starved does not need italics for emphasis. One should read the Dakota people starved as a straightforward and plainly stated fact. As a result, and without any other options but to continue to starve, Dakota people retaliated. Dakota warriors organized, struck out, and killed settlers and traders. This revolt is called the Sioux Uprising. Eventually, the U.S. Cavalry came to Minnesota to confront the uprising. More than 1,000 Dakota people were sent to prison. As already mentioned, 38 Dakota men were subsequently hanged. After the hanging, those 1,000 prisoners were released. However, as further consequence, what remained of Dakota territory in Minnesota was dissolved, stolen. The Dakota people had no land to return to. This means they were exiled. Homeless, the Dakota people of Minnesota were relocated forced onto reservations in South Dakota and Nebraska. Now every year, a group called the Dakota 38 plus two riders conduct a memorial horse ride from Lower Brule, South Dakota to Mankato, Minnesota. The memorial riders travel 325 miles on horseback for 18 days, sometimes through sub-zero blizzards. They conclude their journey on December 26, the day of the hanging. Memorials help focus our memory on particular people or events. Often memorials come in the forms of plaques, statues, or gravestones. The memorial for the, memorial for the Dakota 38 is not an object inscribed with words, but an act. Yes, I started this piece because I was interested in writing about grasses, so there's another event to include, although it's not in chronological order, and we must backtrack a little. 
When the Dakota people were starving, as you may remember, government traders would not extend store credit to Indians. One trader named Andrick Myrick is famous for his refusal to provide credit to Dakota people by saying, if they are hungry, let them eat grass. There are variations of Myrick's words, but they are all something to that effect. When settlers and traders were killed during the Sioux uprising, one of the first to be executed by the Dakota was Andrew Myrick. When Myrick's body was found, his mouth was stuffed with grass. I'm inclined to call this act by the Dakota warriors a poem. There's irony in their poem. There was no text. Real poems do not really require words. I've italicized the previous symptom sentence to indicate inner dialogue, a revealing moment. But on second thought, the words, let them eat grass, click the gears of the poem into place. So we could also say language and word choice are crucial to the poem's work. Things are circling back again. Sometimes when in a circle, if I wish to exit, I must leap and let the body swing from the platform out to the grasses. Her final phrase to the grasses resonates throughout her book, Whereas. It was written as a response to the Congressional Resolution of Apology to Native Americans that President Obama signed in 2009. Long Soldier ends her long poem of the same name with what another Native writer, Linda Hogan, calls something like a prayer, a hope, a yearning for home and for our future life. The grasses, grasses, grasses. Long Soldier leaves no space, no breath between these words. This week, as you take a moment to reflect, I invite you to listen to the grass around you, in your yard, in vacant lots you pass by, on dry mountainsides, wherever and everywhere you are. In Utah, we're surrounded by so many different kinds of grasses. Imported Kentucky bluegrass in our yards, ornamental grasses, native indigenous grasses, and those we name weeds. As you listen, what stories might be these grasses be telling you? What might be hidden inside, beneath, and underneath the stalks of grasses. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.